So my presentation today, I suppose I'm going to start us off with kind of reflecting on ourselves and our own work as human factors professionals, human factors practitioners, and how our work might change into the future with other future trends that are happening in work. Um, so hopefully you'll sort of um, enjoy the journey and kind of see a little bit of, um, of yourself in this as well. And we used a method called cognitive work analysis, which I'll talk about um, as I go through. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, so um, Katie Schultz, um, Natasia Good and Paul Salmon, who were involved in this work as well. So human factors and ergonomics practitioner role. I probably don't need to tell people in this audience um, that it's, it can be pretty diverse in terms of um, the types of things that we work on, so the application areas in which we work, um, the types of disciplinary backgrounds that people come from, so you know whether it's engineering or psychology or sociology or physiology, many, many different um, disciplines. And then we all work in really diverse organisations as well. So people who are working in government organisations or consulting or different industries. Um, and so it's all this kind of diversity in, in what is you know, human factors and ergonomics. Um, and then we've got this new challenge of needing to adapt to the changing domains in which we work. So, you know, technology is moving on and, and kind of workplaces are moving on. So we need to keep up to date with that as well. So we wanted to do this study um, to look at... Um, to actually use a human factors method or a systems thinking method to analyse the role of the human factors practitioner um, from a systems perspective and then use this analysis to see how the role might change into the future because that sort of has implications for how we um, do our professional development, how we train up um, new um, practitioners as well. And to do that, in terms of to do that thinking about future work, um, I had a look at a paper by Jan Dahl, um, which meant many of you might be familiar with. Um, it's called A Strategy for Human Factors in Ergonomics, Developing the Discipline and Profession. It was published in Ergonomics um, a few years ago now. But um, in that paper, the authors brought out um, what they think are the key trends for the future of work, basically, in the future of um, what human factors is going to have to work with. And so they talked about um, these trends of advances in, in ICT being a obvious one, you know, we're having this technological advances. Then we've got related to that the kind of change in work systems globally. So, you know, in you know, perhaps in some sort of developing countries, we're seeing more mechanisation and more industrialization, but then in more um, kind of higher income countries, uh, we're seeing a lot more in introduction of automation, things like AI that Paul was talking about. So there's these sort of changes in work systems that are going on. We're also seeing more um, kind of reflection on cultural diversity and dealing with diversity better um, with globalisation and some of these other changes that are occurring in work where we now need to be really aware of um, diverse users. That also relates to ageing, so we're seeing ageing populations and so there's that addition of diversity um, in terms of user needs as well. Um, and the last two are kind of more general trends in work. So, you know, this sort of enhanced business competitiveness and the need for innovation, that kind of constant push to do things better and quicker. And then also sustainability and corporate social responsibility. So um, as us working in organisations, they're sort of key trends that, um, that we're all working towards. So we use this method called cognitive work analysis that some of you might be familiar with. It's, um, it comes from a, a range of methods that fall under this cognitive systems engineering sort of framework. So there's a few different methods that fall within that. And it was developed sort of in the the 1980s in Denmark at the Riso National Lab and they were looking at nuclear power plants and they were looking at how can we design safe nuclear power um, for Denmark. And so it's really, it's, it's a way of um, looking at complex systems um, and understanding them. And it comes from this idea that the designers can't anticipate all scenarios in advance within complex systems, so you need to design for adaptation and flexibility and things like that. Um, and I won't go into too much detail, but it's a formative method, so it sort of helps you to look at adaptation and flexibility rather than just describing what should be done. It's been used a lot for the evaluation of systems, um, the design and improvement of systems, um, and things like that, but we wanted to use it in a novel way to look at, look at human factors itself. It has five phases of analysis, um, which again, I won't go through in much detail. Um, other than to say that in this particular study, we use the first phase. Um, it's called work domain analysis. Um, and what it does is it's sort of like a qualitative model um, and it describes the, the whole system and the constraints on that system based on its purpose, its functions and the components that are within it. And it sort of gives you a nice sort of holistic view of, of, of a system. And so we wanted to use that um, in this study. And in terms of our method or how we went about doing that, um, so we started off with um, 
so over here in my flowchart, um, it started off with a systematic search for human factors in ergonomics job advertisements and position descriptions. So we actually went online, we went on to Seek and a few other websites and we said, all right, well, what are people advertising as the human factors role? And that in itself was quite interesting. I mean, I've just pulled some of these um, on the left here off, off the internet. These aren't the ones that were used in the study. They're actually current ones, I think. Um, but you know, there's, there's always lots of jobs being advertised in human factors, which is great. Um, and we actually took, we did a content analysis from that. What are the keywords about what is the purpose of the role? What are the functions that people are undertaking? Um, what are some of the skills they need and things like that? Um, we also use the definitions that are, that are around in terms of human factors. So we looked at the IEA definition and some of the frameworks, um, a few of the websites of the professional bodies like HFESA um, and use some of that work as well. And so we'd use that for a documentation review to, to develop an initial model. Um, and then uh, three of us worked together to build a draft work domain analysis. And then we did a Delphi study, um, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail, to um, basically finalise the model and make sure that um, people who had experience as human factors practitioners agreed that it was a, a decent model. Uh, so our Delphi study, so we used a two-round modified Delphi, and the way we did that was via an online survey. Um, so we did recruit, we recruited seven human factors and ergonomics practitioners within Australia. And it is a small sample size, but um, they did have quite a lot of experience. So they had a mean of 14 years experience and they all had, you know, at least over five years experience um, as practitioners. Um, they all but one held formal qualifications. They all but one held a bachelor's and then we had people at various levels of postgraduate um, study as well. And we had a nice mix of people who worked in consultancies or the private sector, a few in government um, and one in a not-for-profit. And they had experience across a range of dom domains um, as well and five were certified professional ergonomists. Now, this is our model. I should have warned you before I flicked over to that slide. So this is the final model and I am going to talk you through it. Sorry for the shock there. Um, so it's probably a little bit hard to read, um, so I do apologise for that, but I'm going to highlight some parts of it as I talk through it. Basically, what this is, so this is the work domain analysis, um, and what it shows is within all the nodes, um, so the boxes are nodes and the lines between them are links, um, and what we have right up the top, oh, sorry, I keep moving away. Um, so right up the top, we have what is the purpose of the human factors practitioner role, so all those nodes up the top are talking about the purpose. Then we have um, the, what we call the values and priority measures. So these are how can we judge or evaluate whether the purposes are being achieved. At the next level, we have the functions that need to be achieved by the person in the role to achieve their purposes. As we go down to the bottom, we can see what the physical objects are that people use in their job. And the next level up from that tells us, well, what do those physical objects um, do to help us achieve our functions and therefore achieve our purposes? And I'll just run through some examples over the next slides. So in terms of the purposes, um, so I've taken all those boxes and just put them in as dot points so you can actually read them. So what we came up as the purposes um, were to optimise human wellbeing, to optimise overall system performance, to integrate human factors and ergonomics across the organisation or whatever kind of area you're working in, um, to ensure regulatory compliance, and this came through a bit more in the kind of safety areas, um, but it was you know, considered a purpose. Uh, to improve and or maintain safety and to contribute to profitability and or business performance. And that obviously becomes important if you're working in the private sector or if you're in a consultancy. Um, and I should say at, the, at this point as well, the scope was for it to be generic. So it should kind of apply to a range of roles because obviously people are in quite diverse roles. So this won't apply to every, um, every role. In terms of the measures that we can use to tell if the purposes are being achieved, um, we have whether the work sort of aligns with good human factors and ergonomics principles. Um, we have compliance as a measure as well, so sometimes you might need to comply to a standard or something like that, or procedures. Um, the improvement of safety processes or outcomes, so are we seeing safety improvement? That's how we know if we're doing a good job. Um, and an interesting one was whether HFE is, um, has influence or value in the organisation. So a practitioner, practitioners were telling us they can kind of tell if they're doing a good job because people are actually inviting them to be involved in projects and they've got some influence um, across the organisation. In terms of the functions, so these are the sort of general functions that a practitioner might perform, and these are just some examples, I should say. So there's the requirements definition processes, system design, um, shaping and modifying human behaviour through HF principles, uh, risk assessment, evaluation, stakeholder engagement, business development, and the list goes on. Um, so 
And I'll just explain how the links work now as well. So if you look at the very bottom, so this is a sort of one of our physical objects or the things that we use to do our job. So if the physical object is um, theories, methods, and a knowledge base around cognitive ergonomics, that can help us to do cognitive ergonomics assessments. That can assist us to do our evaluation. Um, we can judge if the evaluation is good by the, how well it aligns with um, HFE principles um, and the, the overall purpose that we're doing the evaluation is to optimise overall system performance, for, any, for example. And so all of these links have pathways that you can trace through the work domain analysis, so it's quite a nice template um, that you can use. Now, um, so the question for this particular talk was more about how the role will change over time. So what we did was we took the, um, those themes that were in that paper that I talked about and we colour coded each of these nodes according to the theme. So what will change based on each theme? And I'll talk through a couple of examples. Um, so in terms of the ageing and cultural diversity themes, so what will change in the HFE practitioner role to kind of deal with that trend? Um, and I'll just highlight and read out a couple of the examples. So for example, some of our um, design tools like scenarios or software might need to change if we need to deal with a kind of different um, range of users. So, um, and the same with our models and simulations. So if we've got modeling, you know, phys physiological modeling of people, that might need to change to be more inclusive um, of different groups. Um, existing data sets as well, so anthropometric data sets and things like that. Other things that may change would be how we gather user requirements. So if we're looking um, at developing a product that's going to be used globally, um, how are we going to gather requirements from people who might be overseas? Um, so we might need to use technology to do that, um, build new ways of doing that sort of, that sort of work. Um, we've also got negotiating trade-offs. So this one here I thought was quite important because when you are kind of broadening your scope of users, um, you're probably going to have more trade-offs around um, you know, needs and preferences and, and things like that. So that will become important. Um, advocating for users as well. So who is your user? Who are you advocating for? And user satisfaction. Just quickly, because I know I don't have a lot of time left. Um, there's also obviously the change due to information technology and the kind of, um, and this, this is interesting because this changes in the work systems that we're responding to as well as in our own work systems. So there's sort of a two, um, way to, two ways to look at this one. Um, so, for example, um, the first one I've highlighted here is actually domain objects, um, resources and the knowledge base within the domain. So that's saying, well, if people are starting to bring in um, AI or automation within the workplaces that I'm, um, that I'm working in, I need to improve my skills around understanding that or my methods around how I'm going to cope with that. Then we have, um, again, gathering user requirements. So ICT might actually bring you methods and tools and ways that we can do that, um, which, is, which is exciting. Um, system design. Um, so that could be a huge, you know, many more options for how we design displays, design systems and tools um, and technologies that workers can use. Um, and also ways that we might actually work to shape and modify human behaviour through technology. Um, but then there's also a whole chunk of things, I think there was three things around data analytics and dealing with um, like big data sources that we're, we're going to start to have access through, to through technology. Um, are we going to need new analysis methods and new software maybe to help us to do that? And then also and there's another section that's more around how we engage with stakeholders and collaborate with one another. So obviously technology is giving us the um, new opportunities to work more globally, to um, share information, to become more collaborative. So from the human factors kind of community point of view, there's lots of opportunities there as well. So. Um, just in conclusion, because hopefully I can get a question maybe. Um, so the work domain analysis model um, helps to provide a generic summary of the human factors practitioner role. It helped to demonstrate the diversity of the role. So as we were going through it, it was clear that there's, you know, there's actually a lot within what we're doing um, and the knowledge and the skills and the expertise that's required. Um, it provides a structured and systematic way for us to consider the effect of change as well, so as we've demonstrated. Um, and basically the future sort of brings change both to the the domains in which we're using HFE as well as the own 
our own ways of working. And it's worth considering this as we look at, you know, developing new training or um, qualifications around human factors and also ongoing professional development opportunities. So we're sort of considering this future uh, focus in that as well. Um, I just want to say a special thank you to um, Katie, who's the second author on this paper. She developed the work domain analysis as part of her honours thesis in psychology last year. Um, she's doing her master's at the moment. Um, but we'd also like to thank the, um, the practitioners who were in our Delphi study. We really appreciate the time they gave us and their feedback. Um, and also the HFESA helped distribute um, the information to recruit participants. So thank you to the HFESA as well. Um, and just quickly before I finish, um, some of you may have seen a little handout on your seat already, but um, we're running a seminar next year in February um, as part of the Centre for Human Factors and Sociotechnical Systems. If people are interested in learning a little bit more about these systems methods and some of the work that we've been doing, um, please come along. Um, their website's down the bottom there. And the early bird rate will finish at the end of this month, so you know, check it out and, and see if that's something you're interested in.